Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, edition of uh, View on Africa. Uh, I want to particularly welcome our online uh, participant, and to say today we'll be focusing on uh, the expansion of the Islamic State uh, on the continent. Uh, we intend to look at it from from the following uh, uh, perspective. One will look at uh, just a very brief overview of uh, the Islamic State. Uh, we'll then look at uh, what are the objectives of the Islamic State, what do they want. Uh, then the uh, strategic importance of Africa, uh, zooming in on sub-Saharan uh, Africa. Uh, then we'll look at the ISIS expansion, uh, look at the core activities of the group in Africa, and then the, the, what the continent uh, can do to push back the Islamic State. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time with this uh, slide because uh, the Islamic State, I think the ISS has written a lot on it. Uh, we, uh, uh, it's on the media almost on a daily basis. So what I just want to highlight is that uh, you know, this, this is a group that has evolved uh, since uh, 2002, when, you know, the foundation stone was first laid in uh, Jordan uh, by um, Abu Musab uh, al-Zakawi. Uh, then he moved to uh, Iraq after the invasion of uh, that country by the United States government in response to the attacks uh, on 9-11. Um, and since then, of course, the group has evolved in very, with various names. Uh, its uh, latest name is the Islamic State, short and simple. Um, I think the choice for the Islamic State is also very strategic. It's not uh, by uh, chance uh, because uh, the previous name, which was the uh, Islamic State uh, of uh, Iraq and Syria, uh, actually limited the group only to these two countries. Uh, though we know it is still based there, the caliphate that it declares is still based there, but uh, you know the Islamic State uh, gives a global connotation, which means that this is a group that uh, it is global. Uh, their objective is to be global in nature. What are the ob objectives of the Islamic State? Uh, there are many of them. I will not go into the nitty gritty ones, uh, but really to look at the broad uh, objectives of uh, the group. Uh, the core one is, of course, the establishment and fun effective functioning of the caliphate, uh, which they did in June 2014. Uh, that's when the caliphate was actually uh, declared. Uh, the second key objective, in my view, is, of course, to make the caliphate global. And that means uh, expansion uh, of uh, you know uh, the the Iraqi Syria based uh, group to cover the whole globe to cover the whole world uh, and of course the key objective also is to make sure that all Muslims uh, are part of uh, this uh, Islamic State so all Muslims have to pledge allegiance uh, to the Caliph who is uh, al Baghdadi so these uh, are really the key uh, uh, objectives that are driving the activities of the Islamic State uh, around the world, including uh, in Africa. Now, let's uh, briefly look at uh, the strategic importance of the continent. Why is it that the Islamic State will want to uh, move to the continent, particularly uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa? Because the, I think uh, the links with uh, North Africa are already there, uh, given the uh, overwhelming uh, Muslim uh, population, uh, but with, uh, and of, of course, the connection with uh, the Middle East, which, you know, most people do not uh, treat North Africa as part of Africa, but uh, usually as uh, part of the Middle East. And I think the Islamic State is also coming from that uh, perspective. Uh, but I think, yeah, what we want to uh, really look at is uh, why uh, is uh, Sub-Saharan Africa becoming uh, a strategic importance for the group? Why is it that uh, the group will want to move uh, towards uh, sub, sub saharan Africa? Uh, in my view, uh, I think that uh, the continent provides a gateway to Europe uh, and, of course, to the Middle East. 
which means that you know uh, from uh, the continent, you can access Europe easily. We've seen that with North Africa, especially with the migration movement, that uh, uh, the phenomenon that has recently hit the world, um, uh, that North Africa has really been uh, the gateway, you know, where refugees or uh, migrants uh, cross over into, into Europe. And uh, countries like Libya, uh, partly Egypt and Morocco uh, have uh, provided uh, that uh, strategic route for migrant uh, movement. Um, so with this uh, 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 geographic location of the continent, um, you know, the Islamic State cannot uh, ignore, uh, you know, the importance, especially, you know, given the fact that the caliphate is just right next door where, you know, you need uh, um, North African countries to really assess, uh, you know, the, the caliphate. Then I also think that uh, ISIS needs uh, foreign fighters from Africa. Uh, we've seen that um, around the world, uh, but um, in sub-Saharan Africa, we've not seen a lot of uh, uh, foreign fighters. Uh, we've seen uh, that in South Africa, we've seen uh, in part of uh, the continent, but uh, let's look at the strategic importance of the foreign fighters uh, to the Islamic State, particularly given the moment in time that you know, they, they are losing a lot of grounds. I think the, the American intelligence or security uh, or the military officers estimate that um, the uh, Islamic State has lost uh, uh, 45,000 or about 45,000 uh, men and women, uh, fighters, uh, you know, in the past uh, two years or so. This is huge if uh, it is really true that, you know, uh, a group uh, such as this uh, could lose uh, 45,000 uh, fighters and still be able, you know, to to stand up to the international coalition. Uh, so it is really uh, immense uh, in terms of the nature of the Islamic State. So uh, with these losses, I think that Africa becomes more strategic in terms of looking for foreign fighters. Um, the continent uh, has not been the greatest suppliers of foreign fighters uh, to uh, uh, the Islamic State. If you take away the the north. Um, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, I think Nigeria will come first, and then we'll be talking of Senegal. Nigeria, many of the Nigerian fighters who, of course, uh, are members of Boko Haram, who declared uh, or uh, pledged allegiance to ISIS uh, in March 2015. Uh, I think that has been the most beneficial uh, factor, the fact that ISIS has been able to benefit from uh, foreign fighters living in Nigeria, encouraged by Boko Haram to fight in Libya. Uh, many of them uh, were in Libya, very few went to Iraq uh, and Syria. So therefore, um, uh, Libya provided a gateway for the recruitment of foreign fighters from different parts of the continent, including, of course, Sub-Saharan uh, Africa, where you know many of the fighters uh, met uh, in Libya and constitute the greatest uh, uh, um, foreign fighters uh, population uh, in Libya. So it is uh, really a huge thing because you need these foreign fighters, uh, fighters to sustain the, the caliphate. You need these foreign fighters to, to, uh, for the Islamic State to be able to stand up you know, to the international coalition that uh, is really putting a lot of pressure on the group. And then there is uh, also, of course, uh, the Islamic State knows very well. They have their own strategic assessment of the continent. They know that there are a lot of ungoverned spaces. If you look at the Sahel, you look at uh, part of uh, uh, Central Africa, you know, in Chad, uh, you know, in northern Nigeria and so on, the Lake Chad Basin, um, where, you know, you, you have uh, spaces that uh, are not really securitized by uh, government or are, are not part of the regular security arrangement uh, of countries. Um, so therefore, uh, with these porous borders, with these ungoverned spaces, uh, you know, I think the Islamic State uh, assess that uh, the continent can provide, uh, you know, sanctuaries um, for its members, uh, you know, sanctuaries where they can um, uh, plan, they can uh, do recruitment, they can carry out uh, various uh, activities uh, on the continent to promote their presence. As we have said, that, you know, the objective is to go global. And then, of course, there is... Uh, um, the fact that they need resources. Um, the continent is very rich in natural resources. Uh, and indeed, we, we've had uh, the presence of most of the global terrorist groups. Uh, of course, Al Qaeda is not uh, uh, in debate here. Um, we have Hezbollah, we've had Hamas, uh, we've had various uh, terrorist groups that have come here, not really to plan 
uh, and attack African countries, but to exploit uh, resources of the continent. We've seen that, especially with diamonds. We've seen that uh, with gold and other uh, gemstones, um, especially associated with uh, Hezbollah. Um, so I think that the Islamic State also want to tap into these resources, uh, which they desperately need, you know, to continue to uh, uh, feed the bills that uh, um, are actually uh, for the fighting uh, of the, the coalition. And then, uh, of course, there is the fact that, you know, the continent, given uh, uh, the fact that, you know, we, we have this very weak uh, government uh, that the Islamic State will want to establish here, if pressure on them in Syria and Libya continues uh, as it is uh, ongoing. If they continue to lose the way they are losing, I think that they believe that uh, uh, they are much more likely to sustain uh, their future in Africa than uh, in the Middle East or in Syria and Iraq today, where you know the international uh, coalition is really determined to root them out. So Africa, therefore, provides a future for the Islamic State. Uh, yeah, uh, again, this, this is the map that uh, was actually published by the Islamic State uh, in 2015. You could see then how they define their territories, you know, who was part of them and so on. Uh, you could see uh, that the link here is mostly with uh, groups that were already existing uh, uh, in Africa. So they tap into them, these groups uh, pledge allegiance uh, to the Islamic State. They, they, the one on that debate here is uh, the Mali uh, al murubutu uh, which was pledged, uh, pledged by um, uh, Abu uh, Wahali uh, Sahrawi, uh, this uh, Sahrawi uh, uh, fighter uh, who became uh, the leader. Uh, actually, he was a former uh, Mujao, former uh, Ansar Din uh, uh, commander uh, who decided, uh, you know, after the, um, uh, Mujao match. Mujahid mean uh, movement um, for the unity of jihad uh, in West Africa. So this group merged with uh, uh, the Mokta uh, uh, group uh, to become Muru uh, Am Muru Bitum. Now, when this group merged uh, and uh, uh, Walid became uh, a key commander, he decided to pledge allegiance uh, to the Islamic State. Uh, you know, to the uh, and drew, uh, of course, opposition from uh, Bemokta, who opposed it and said, of course, he is the commander in chief, he is the leader of Amuru Butun, and uh, Walid uh, didn't have any uh, authority to, to declare it. Uh, but by doing this, by opposing the Islamic State uh, openly like this, uh, Bemokta himself put himself in danger, and the Islamic State actually. Uh, started hunting him. They actually put out posters in Libya where they thought uh, Bemokta was the impediment, or as they call it, the, the awakening, uh, which uh, is uh, in the uh, Islamist uh, lexicon uh, um, uh, parlance, actually means that uh, this is a group that is actually impeding the work of uh, a jihad, is actually impeding jihad and therefore uh, should not uh, exist. So uh, Bemokta was hunted. Uh, uh, and uh, Islamic State actually put out a poster for um, the warrant of uh, death of uh, uh, Mokhtar. So that's the only controversial one, but you could see that, you know, uh, here uh, they, they are well positioned in North Africa, uh, in sub saharan Africa, particularly in the Sahel, you could see Mali, uh, Nigeria, uh, Sudan, uh, of course, we, we will see a broader picture of this. Of course, this one was in 2015 when they wanted to prove that uh, they are now global. So they put out these maps uh, for every region where they have uh, affiliate. This is uh, Walid. Uh, you could see he, he, he was the commander, of course, of uh, um, Mujao. Uh, and then he pledged allegiance. Uh, and of course, he's now the Islamic State uh, representative in the Sahel. Uh, and he's also the one that um, carried out the attacks on Burkina Faso. Now, this is the, the, the expansion. Uh, it, look, it doesn't seem very clear uh, from here, but I hope you can see the red uh, dot or the red uh, squares, uh, they represent areas where you know um, the Islamic State is already firmly 
uh, in place. And the green uh, represent where they, they are exploring, where they've had some presence or they, they, uh, uh, they have some reconnaissance uh, mission. Uh, you can see that uh, this is uh, really all over the continent. Um, you could see Mauritania, you can see Senegal, you can see Guinea, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, yes, Ghana, of course. Uh, you can also see Central African Republic, Uganda, Ethiopia, Rwanda, uh, Tanzania, and of course, uh, South Africa, where, you know, there have been uh, recently a lot of discussion about the Islamic State presence uh, in this country and their recruitment uh, activities. So really, the expansion is, is real. It's not something that's, uh, you know, uh, um, is uh, a myth. Uh, you can see uh, that really um, the, from the picture that we saw, which was just last year, um, really for me, the, the, uh, the expansion is like wildfire. Um, you know, uh, that's one to take over the whole of the continent. Uh, and therefore, um, you know, if this were to continue, I think by next year, uh, you know, the Islamic State will have uh, swallowed the whole continent if the trend continue as it is. This is, uh, you know, to again to demonstrate the strategic ob objective of uh, globalizing the caliphate. Uh, you could see to your left uh, the African map, uh, you know, which was the areas they initially identified as the caliphate. Um, you see that most of uh, Southern Africa or part of uh, Central Africa also uh, were not part of the strategic vision uh, of the Islamic State. Um, so, yeah, therefore, Sub-Saharan Africa was not really as important, though, because of the links between the Sahel in West Africa and North Africa, they thought, uh, you know, um, that should be part of their strategic vision, extending right uh, to Somalia, uh, covering Ethiopia, of course. And then uh, in 2016, this map was redrawn to, to, to show, to illustrate their new uh, strategic objective, which is to be completely global, to cover every spot on the continent. Uh, and therefore, no country uh, is safe. Uh, with this uh, new uh, objective. What kind of strategies are they using to, to expand? Uh, we've seen that they, 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 they are using uh, affiliate organizations. These are organizations that were already existing. Some of them had pledged allegiance to the uh, Al Qaeda and then had to switch, such as uh, Boko Haram, though Boko Haram never really uh, uh, formally pledged allegiance to uh, Al Qaeda, but uh, you know, um, uh, it, there was no uh, secret in the fact that uh, Boko Haram was an Al Qaeda affiliate. Uh, but the switch, uh, of course, in March 2015, when you know uh, Abu Bakr Al Shekau, the leader of Boko Haram, pledged uh, allegiance uh, to uh, Al Baghdadi. Of course, a pledge that is now under um, debate. Uh, because, um, you know, um, in um, August this year, um, uh, the Islamic State uh, appointed a new leader uh, in the name of uh, Abu Musab uh, al-Banawi, uh, you know, the supposed or purported son of the founder of Boko Haram, uh, Muhammad uh, Yusuf. So uh, now the, the, the position of um, Shekau is really questionable. And of course, we know that uh, he split because of that decision and now continue his traditional uh, Boko Haram uh, group, the so-called uh, Alusuna Lidawati Wajiha, which is the original name of Boko Haram. So he has continued with that. So then therefore, um, uh, that's one strategy, the use of uh, uh, affiliate groups, but they, they also have uh, reconnaissance or exploratory missions where they actually send people you know, from uh, key strategic region, the coup even come from Syria or Iraq. Uh, you know, these are very close uh, confidants of uh, the, the group. So they explore different countries to see what are the different possibilities that they have. We've seen uh, in some cases arrests of these uh, people like in Nigeria. Um, but then uh, there is also the direct invitation. So uh, the Islamic State will actually directly invite groups, uh, you know, to join them, to pledge allegiance. They did that with Al Shabab, uh, but it didn't quite work because of the strong links that Al Shabab has uh, with Al Qaeda. And these strong links is coming from the relationship that Al Shabab had uh, with uh, Osama bin Laden. Uh, we know that you know Osama bin Laden's uh, 
uh, activities actually began uh, in Somalia, you know, in terms of its his global uh, reach, you know, in uh, in the 90s. And of course, uh, Al Shabaab, uh, though was not there, but Somalia was very important for the bombings in Kenya and uh, Tanzania in 1998, in August 1998. Then we, we have the identification and appointment of local and discreet uh, recruiters. These are local individuals who, you know, the Islamic State, because of uh, um, their willingness to serve with the Islamic State, they are appointed as uh, recruiters. These individuals, they go around to recruit people face to face uh, or even promote the propaganda of the group. Uh, this is a very popular one uh, because these are local faces. These are not strangers. These are individuals that you might know. Uh, so they come to you to actually uh, 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 convince you, to persuade you to join the Islamic State. And then there is, of course, the social media propaganda, which uh, I think it is the biggest medium that the Islamic State is using today to reach out to millions of people around the world. And uh, mostly you'd have fallen victims uh, into that. There is also the, the case where they use force you know, to force people to, to join the group. And if you cannot join, they might kill you or kill uh, your family uh, members. Uh, so that's uh, also uh, one uh, strategy that they use, which is also very uh, popular. And they do that with extreme uh, brutality to really intimidate uh, potential uh, recruit. Uh, we'll move uh, now to really look at uh, the kind of uh, options that uh, Africa has. I don't want to go through this uh, very long slide. What I want to do probably is to uh, look at uh, this diagram, which I think uh, summarizes um, the, um, uh, the, the options uh, for Africa. Now, what I think the first thing that African countries uh, have to do is first to ensure absolute territorial control. Any country that is unable to ensure absolute territorial control um, is really susceptible to uh, the Islamic State uh, because this is exactly what they are looking for. We've seen earlier that you know uh, ungoverned spaces, porous borders uh, have really attracted uh, 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 this group uh, to uh, mobilize people into these countries that they find uh, uh, vulnerable. So. Then I also think that the Afri African countries will need really to beef up their intelligence capacity. Intelligence has to be trained and adapted just to pursue the Islamic State. So it's not just any kind of training. It's not just any kind of intelligence. It's specific intelligence to pursue the Islamic State. And this means that uh, the element or the individuals involved in this must uh, uh, really understand the dynamics, the organizational structure, and all the details associated with the Islamic State. And of course, there is the need for uh, intelligence cooperation. Uh, I think we've done a good job uh, uh, recently in Africa in establishing uh, what I call regional intelligence uh, or fusion uh, centers. Uh, these centers are extremely important. We have them in Kenya. We have them in uh, West Africa and the Sahel. I think Southern Africa is also coming uh, on board. Uh, so we need to utilize these groups, uh, these centers really to improve uh, intelligence sharing, really to improve uh, intelligence gathering on the Islamic State. Uh, I don't think that we've utilized these uh, uh, centers or these uh, uh, groups uh, enough uh, because they, in many cases, they lack uh, basic necessities, they lack basic resources for them to be able to effectively coordinate intelligence around uh, the continent or in their uh, uh, region. There is also, I think, the need for governance and the rule of law, which, of course, you know, you need to be able to uh, uh, establish effective rule of law um, to make sure that all those who offend the constitution or commit whatever offenses um, should be brought to justice. Um, most often, when countries pursue the military uh, uh, the, the dynamic or dimension alone without uh, the rule of law accompanying it, they risk uh, actually uh, backlash that you know could exaggerate the threat of the Islamic State. So what we need first is that countries should establish effective 
rule of law and governance institutions should be uh, um, trained uh, and uh, incapacitated so that they should be able to uh, carry out the necessary tax that they should do because the Islamic State, the, the, the fight against the Islamic State is an uh, interdisciplinary uh, uh, um, operation. It's not an operation that is really uh, in one domain such as the police, as most people will uh, see it, or for intelligence. No, uh, even people in the financial sector have a lot to contribute to it. Uh, we, we do have around the continent financial intelligence unit. Uh, they need to be utilized uh, effectively, you know, in the pursuit of the Islamic State. Then we, we have, of course, the need to build the capacity of the police and other security agencies. Uh, so far, uh, the, the main gap with this uh, uh, institution, particularly the police around the continent, um, is that there's not enough uh, uh, um, uh, what I call specialized capacity. You know, we don't have within the police specialized capacity for certain tasks, such as you know, uh, um, dealing with the Islamic State. Dealing with terrorism, it's okay. Dealing, dealing with violent extremism, is okay. But when it comes to the pursuit of a single group, you need to have uh, much more knowledge of that group, which means that, you know, uh, uh, the police need uh, retraining. They need a specific adaptation to the character of that group. And then, of course, uh, we, we need uh, spe uh, a special counter Islamic State propaganda. So countries should be able to develop special counter Islamic State propaganda. So you need, first of all, to understand the propaganda of the Islamic State and then develop a counter propaganda to that, to actually uh, persuade youth uh, from joining the Islamic State. And then, of course, uh, which is a big problem on the continent, uh, the lack of uh, social media policing. Uh, in many of our countries, we don't have that capacity to really monitor effectively and intervene on time uh, when we see things uh, going on in the uh, uh, social media. And of course, the challenge here is how to balance between, you know, human rights, uh, which make, uh, to make sure that you respect the right of privacy. People should still be able to use social media for the purposes that uh, it is meant for um, and not for the bad purpose. So governments should be able to really balance between that because if they cross the line, um, they will invite backlashes that could actually uh, be detrimental to uh, the uh, operation. And then uh, I want to conclude with uh, uh, really a, a critical appraiser to look at whether, you know, uh, um, does the continent have uh, the capacity uh, can we really do it? Can we really prevent the Islamic State from expanding? Um, my initial reaction is that no, um, the continent uh, lacks that capacity. Um, first, we are not as united as we should be in terms of coordinating our activities in this particular domain. Our intelligence uh, officers, they still fight each other um, instead of uh, uniting to uh, promote uh, you know, intelligence sharing and uh, uh, also acting uh, together. And then, of course, I think that the, the Islamic State itself is a, is a monster. It, this is huge. They are well organized, well equipped, uh, despite recent losses in territories, uh, in uh, um, uh, human resources, financial resources, and other resources. It is still by far the most powerful terrorist group in the world, which means that it should not be taken for granted. Uh, we need to pursue it with all our might because they're using all their might, uh, you know, to uh, uh, pursue their own uh, objectives. Then the, 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 the continent, of course, uh, needs um, regional uh, 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 mechanisms. Uh, I've also insisted here that the African Union need to uh, come on board. Um, the AU could establish within the uh, counterterrorism committee that they already have within the Peace and Security Council to actually uh, designate um, a, a, a subcommittee that will be responsible just for uh, the Islamic State. This subcommittee will gather intelligence, will promote uh, intelligence sharing on the Islamic State so that the continent can really uh, beef up uh, its knowledge and capabilities to confront uh, the group. And then, of course, uh, the, there is the fact that on the continent, um, 
countries that have not experienced a terrorist attack or violent extremism tend to be uh, naive, if not complacent in their attitude, in the sense that some will actually uh, neglect, uh, you know, the fight against groups such as the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda uh, on the basis that, you know, um, these groups do not pose a threat to them. Um, you know, when uh, knowledge and history, uh, you know, um, uh, tell us that, you know, it's, it's a matter of time, you know, with time, you know, any country uh, on the continent can uh, fall victim to the Islamic State.